In my previous video on Kohler illumination, I described Kohler's methods and his reasons for coming up with them. In this video, I'll show you how you can power the Puma Kohler illuminator with daylight, and I'll describe an extension to Kohler illumination, which I call the Furierfeldblende, that enables some advanced aperture shaping techniques. Imagine if you could have all the benefits of full Kohler illumination, but without the need for a lamp or a power supply. Well, today I'll show you a new Puma module that allows just that. But there's more to it. The same attachment can allow the use of any plain wavefront external light source to enhance Puma's customizability for use in lab experiments, including a logical extension to the Kohler principle for controlling the Fourier aperture of the scope. If you've already built the Puma Kohler Illuminator, fear not, because everything you've made is still useful. The new part I'm describing today is just this simple small ring, and you can see it has these three cavities at one end, and a thread at the other. So, to use this adapter, starting with the full Kohler Illuminator, you simply remove the LED lamp and lower collector module together with its adjustment ring by completely removing the three adjustment thumb screws as shown. Now slide the daylight adapter into the end of the Kohler illuminator, ensuring the cavities in the adapter line up with the adjustment screw mounds, like so, and fix it in place with the adjustment thumb screws as shown. You won't be using these thumb screws for making angular adjustments now, they're solely used to hold this adapter in place. Now take the standard Puma mirror illuminator with its condenser attachment. These modules were described in the video on how to build a foundation scope and in the first condenser video, links to which are in the video description below. You then simply screw the whole mirror assembly into the thread provided by the daylight curler adapter, like so. And now you have an adjustable mirror to direct an external source of light into the curler illuminator. It's as easy as that. However, not any old light source will be suitable. So, what type of light source can be used with this adapter? You may think that the clue is in the name. However, it's important to consider the light path of the Puma Kohler system to understand why you must be careful when selecting the type of external illumination to use, whether it's from natural daylight or an artificial source. The Puma Kohler Illuminator is designed with a split collector lens system, where the lower part of the collector is attached to the lamp and is designed to output an approximately collimated plane wavefront beam. And the upper collector lens is designed to focus that collimated beam on the lower focal plane of the condenser to produce a magnified image of the lamp there. With this daylight adapter, you've removed the lower collector lenses with the lamp and replaced them with a mirror. The upper collector is still in place, however. This upper collector does two things. One, together with the condenser lenses, it focuses the image of the field stop onto the specimen plane. And two, on its own, it focuses the incoming parallel rays onto the lower focal plane of the condenser to produce a magnified image of the light source there. The first effect, imaging the field stop, will occur regardless of the nature of the input light. The second effect, however, requires that the input light be collimated and encode an image of an extended light source. This image, when focused by the upper collector lens, will be positioned at, and ideally fill, the lower focal plane of the condenser for maximum numerical aperture illumination. So, in practice, when using daylight as the illumination source, this daylight must originate from a far away source, like the clouds and the blue sky, or light reflecting off a distant landscape, in order for it to be approximately collimated. You can't just use ambient daylight reflecting from any close source, for example within a room reflecting off a white wall, a curtain, or some other close diffusing object. When using natural daylight in the correct way, it doesn't matter for most ordinary uses of the microscope if the light contains some variation in brightness across the field, such as a combination of clouds and blue sky, or the features of some faraway landscape, because the Kohler principle will even out this illumination in the specimen plane. This is very different to using the mirror as a direct illuminator to the condenser. 
because in that situation the collimated rays will not pass through the upper collector but will hit the condenser directly and be focused by the condenser to form an image of the light source near the specimen plane. This can manifest as distracting uneven illumination and so in that usage it would be beneficial to use an already uniform light source such as a full cloudy sky or a full blue sky or even use a diffuser over the mirror or better still in the lower focal plane of the condenser. However, you must not use a diffuser near the mirror with the daylight curler adapter because then you will scramble the plane wavefront of any incoming collimated light and the image of the diffuser surface will lie close to the specimen plane and so be visible superimposed on the image of the specimen. This is just the kind of distracting artifact that curler illumination was designed to eliminate. Now, I've explained that some variation in the intensity of the daylight used with this daylight adapter is acceptable. However, you'll want to ensure that all the aperture is illuminated and not blocked off by severe light obstructions such as trees or buildings or window frames, etc. You can check this is so by simply removing the eyepiece and looking at the back focal plane of the objective. If you see significant obstructions to the pattern of the illuminated disc, then move the scope or the mirror to a less obstructed position. Be careful, however, not to get a direct reflection of the sun in the mirror at any time or this could damage your eyesight. If you want to use an external artificial light source with this new illumination module, then that light must also be effectively collimated and encode an image of an extended luminous surface, that when this image is focused onto the lower focal plane of the condenser, it will fill this plane to allow use of the maximum numerical aperture of illumination provided by the condenser. Although, if you only intend to use low power objectives, you can relax this criterion. The illumination criteria discussed so far are those that are needed for plain full aperture illumination. However, there may be instances where you do not want the full aperture of the condenser to be illuminated. Some obvious examples are when you want to do Schleieren phase imaging or dark ground microscopy. This daylight module opens up new opportunities on how to achieve this. The standard way to shape the condenser's lower focal plane is with a solid filter or the spatial light modulator or SLM in the Illuminating Aperture Diaphragm slot, or IAD slot, and you can still do it that way with this daylight module. However, this daylight module makes it practical to shape the condenser aperture by using structured light encoded in the collimated input beam, without the need for a solid filter in the lower focal plane of the condenser. This sounds complicated, but it can actually be very easily achieved without additional apparatus. For example, if you're using natural daylight, you can achieve a Schleieren effect by looking for a natural distant horizon between the sky and the ground. You then remove the eyepiece and look down the tube at the back focal plane of the objective and adjust the mirror or microscope position to get the boundary between light and dark positioned so as to fill half the illuminating aperture with light, that is the sky, and the other half with dark, that is the ground, trees, etc. Then when you replace the eyepiece, you will see a Schleieren effect. This example may be handy if you've forgotten to bring your IAD filters with you out in the field, but it is not otherwise particularly useful. The real benefit of this method of shaping the illuminating aperture comes when using an artificial light source in the laboratory. You see, you can set up a system with a structured light source at the focal plane of a converging lens. The converging lens therefore collimates the image of this shaped light source to provide input to the daylight curler system which will then project an image of that structured light source on the condenser's lower focal plane. And the structure of that light source will then form the illuminating aperture of the microscope. In simple cases, this can be a patch stop or semi-disc for dark ground or Schleierian effects, respectively. But it can also be much more complicated, such as a fast scanning spot for Fourier tachographic imaging. The Puma TFT SLM can also allow versatile control of this Fourier aperture, but it has several limitations that were described in the video on the SLM. For example, because the SLM uses a TFT screen, it cuts out a lot of the incident light due to its crossed polarizers, and it always transmits plain polarized light, whereas a light source in this external system using the daylight curler adapter will have minimal losses in intensity and does not need to be polarized. Also, the SLM is partly diffusing, so cannot allow a sharp image of the field stop to be projected. But this external system can make full use of the field stop, 
Furthermore, you can also use corrective lens elements in this external system to compensate for the non-flat Fourier plane of the condenser, whereas the SLM is restricted to providing its filter all in one flat plane. In short, you have much more flexibility in your choice of equipment used to create the structured light aperture in the Fourier plane with this external system compared to the Puma SLM. The external system can be big and bulky and powerful because it does not have to physically fit into the tiny IAD slot like the Puma SLM. These advantages are not all one way though. The Puma SLM is a lot more portable than the external projection system and does not require any additional optics and mechanical components. Finally, the SLM can itself be transformed into a projector by adding a powerful backlight and converging collimating lens, so it can actually be used as an external structured light source for projection. I'll leave details of how to do this for another video. Now, when you think about it, this external structured illuminator projection system is a very similar method for control of the condenser's lower focal plane aperture, i.e. the Fourier aperture of the scope, to the projection method Curler devised to control the image plane aperture. So, just as Curler called his image plane projected aperture the Seffeldblinder, so we could call this optical projection system for defining the condenser's Fourier plane illumination aperture a Fourierfeldblende. Also, just as Curler made his projected aperture so that he could put it inside the solid glass slide to be coplanar with the specimen, so also this Fourierfeldblende can be projected into the glass of the condenser lens. This may be required because with some configurations of the condenser I have found that the optimal lower focal plane can be just inside the glass of the lower condenser lens. No physical stop can be optimized for that, but this external projected aperture can be placed even inside solid glass if required. This is done by varying the distance between the upper collector and the lower lens of the condenser using the spacer ring mechanism described in my first curler video. To demonstrate this external structured aperture projection system, I've set up this simple apparatus. Here, the light source is the screen of this tablet computer, and you can see some aperture functions displayed on it. This level of illumination is sufficient for this demo, but more powerful light sources would be used in practice, like a DMD video projector. However, you should not look down the microscope by eye if using a video projector because some of the light sources they use can be damaging to your eyesight, so only use cameras with those. I've removed the mirror from the daylight curler attachment and stuck a collimating lens on the front of it with blue tack. This lens has a focal length of 1 meter, so the tablet screen is placed exactly 1 meter away so that its light is collimated as it enters the scope. I have a slide on the stage with a specimen that is a thin section of an unstained holly leaf, so most of any contrast seen will be of the phase or scattering type rather than absorbance contrast. The objective is a times 10 objective with a numerical aperture of 0.25, and I chose the collimating lens and its focal length such that the projected image of this tablet screen just fills the numerical aperture of this objective. If I were using a higher numerical aperture objective, I would need to bring the tablet closer to get a bigger image of its screen, and so I would also need to reduce the focal length of the collimating lens accordingly. Bear that calculation in mind if you want to try this experiment at home with a smaller screen like your smartphone or a bigger desktop monitor. On top we have an AF51 camera with a direct coupling to the objective. The camera is focused on the back focal plane of the objective. I'll show you how to do that in a separate tutorial. The camera is connected to this PC which is recording the image, and you can see how the image in the back focal plane of the objective effectively mirrors that of the input structured light aperture. We also want to see what the image of the specimen looks like with these apertures, so for a separate run of the experiment I set up the camera on top of an eyepiece with the full optical tube in place. During the actual experiments, I turn out the room lights to avoid unnecessary light contamination from the environment. So, to the results, and here you can see on the left the bitmaps used as the external apertures, and on the right the corresponding images seen in the back focal plane of the objective. The projection doesn't quite fill the aperture, but it's close enough for this demo. 
Note the optical distortions and chromatic aberrations caused by the cheap molded glass lenses of the Puma Abbe Condenser, but despite this, you can see that the image is still good enough for intricately shaped apertures to be formed. Now, this time on the left, we see the image of the back focal plane of the objective, and on the right, the corresponding image seen looking down the eyepiece. In other words, we have the Fourier plane on the left and the image plane on the right. Note that, in general, what you see in the Fourier plane of a microscope is not a simple single Fourier transform of this specimen image. It's more complex than that, but a fuller explanation will need to wait for a future tutorial. Just a couple of points I want to make at this stage. First, note how specks of dust on lenses at different focal planes can cause an image of the Fourier aperture of the scope to be produced at multiple points on the image plane. Apart from that, Note how the overall background illumination of each image is remarkably flat, despite the illuminating aperture being highly contrasted structured light. This tells you that despite using cheap molded lenses, the Puma Abbe Condenser and Curler system are remarkably effective at allowing structured illumination microscopy experiments, at a tiny fraction of the cost compared to commercial microscopes more commonly used for this purpose. So, you can do these experiments yourself at home, without needing huge research grant funding. Also note the interesting changes in contrast seen with each aperture. I want to emphasize that the specimen focus does not change throughout this experiment, even though some images look blurred. What you're seeing are the effects of selectively attenuating or enhancing certain spatial frequencies due to the effects of the structured illumination in the Fourier aperture of the scope. Look here, for example. This is a sinusoidal aperture function, and it almost obliterates this edge feature. But if we simply rotate the same aperture by 180 degrees, the same feature suddenly becomes super enhanced. We are using the same sinusoidal frequency, but effectively we've just changed its phase, and the effect is dramatic. Now, before I leave this demo, there is one more thing I want to show you. Remember that these aperture images are those seen in the back focal plane of the objective, which is a conjugate plane of the Fourier aperture of the condenser. The difference between the light in those two planes, apart from aberrations introduced by the condenser, is that the light has to pass through the specimen before it gets to the back focal plane of the objective. So, the image you see in the back focal plane is a kind of compound image that carries with it both the intensity distribution of the structured illumination and diffraction information that depends on the structure of the specimen. The visual effects of specimen diffraction in the back focal plane can be hard to see because the illuminating aperture signal component is actually much stronger. Here are before and after images of the back focal plane of the objective. Before means there is no slide on the stage, and after means that the specimen is on the stage. See how the light appears more scattered, more misty, with the specimen present. That mist carries important structural information about the specimen. Here is a subtraction image where the image of the back focal plane without the slide was subtracted from the image of the back focal plane with the specimen in place. The contrast of the subtraction has been enhanced to show the features better. Now, here is the same aperture function, but this time I have a strongly absorbing specimen on the stage. The specimen is that of an EM copper grid mounted on a slide with some ultra-thin sections on it embedded in epoxy, which is this translucent stuff. Now compare the two enhanced subtraction images. On the left is the image using the unstained holly leaf specimen, and on the right the image using the EM grid specimen. The difference is striking and is due to differential diffraction at the specimen prior to light entering the objective. For now, I'll just leave these images for you to consider. I'll need to explain a lot more about the diffraction theory of image formation in microscopy, Fourier transforms, and convolutions before I can discuss these things in more meaningful detail. So that will have to wait for future tutorials. One of the limitations of the standard Puma LED-based curler illuminator is that it does not magnify the image of the LED enough to fill the lower focal plane of the condenser. This means it does not use the full numerical aperture potential of the Abbe condenser. The maximum numerical aperture achievable with the standard LED system is 0.76, which is still good enough to fill the aperture of most high-power dry objectives like these. But 
While it can provide illumination to even higher power immersion objectives, it will not illuminate them to their full resolution potential. The condenser itself, without the standard LED-based curler system, has a maximum numerical aperture of 0.92 dry and 1.1 oiled, which is good for most times 100 objectives, including immersion optics. The daylight curler illuminator has a larger physical aperture than the LED illuminator, so it allows more of the available numerical aperture of the condenser to be used. With full unobstructed illumination, it can provide a numerical aperture of 0.9 dry and 1.0 oiled. This is reduced to about 0.8, whether dry or oiled, if the standard mirror attachment is used, because the mirror itself limits the aperture somewhat. But of course, using this mirror is optional. For even higher numerical apertures, the special Puma High Numerical Aperture Illuminator module must be used, which does not use the Cooler Illuminator at all, and a separate tutorial will cover that module. So, in summary, the Daylight Adapter allows Puma's pre-existing mounted mirror module to be used to direct an independent collimated external light source into the Puma Cooler Illuminator. This allows use of natural daylight for full curler illumination, enhancing Puma's use as a truly portable microscope for fieldwork with ultra-low power requirements. In fact, I don't know of any other microscope that was designed to allow full curler illumination driven by daylight. So, if you've come across such a thing, please post details in the comments so we can all learn whether or not this is truly a first. The Daylight Adapter also allows custom aperture shaping equipment to be used for manipulation of the scope's Fourier illuminating aperture to permit advanced lab-based microscopy imaging experiments with Puma. Now, to be clear, I didn't just invent the method of projecting structured light onto the condenser's lower focal plane. It's been done before, but I'm showing you how you can do it with Puma. I did, however, invent the word Fourierfeldblende, and as far as I know, I've not seen anyone explain such projected structured illumination in terms of a logical extension of Kohler's illumination methods, as I've done here. So, if you know of any prior publication that does this, please let us know in the comments. Finally, I want to announce that I've started a Patreon site to help me continue to do this stuff in the long term. So, if you like what I'm doing with these videos and this open source project, and you have the means and want to support it, a link to my Patreon site is in the video description. But simply subscribing to the channel, giving the video a thumbs up, and telling your friends and students about the project will also help. Thanks for watching.